Hello, and welcome to the Autistic Me Podcast. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt, speaking as the Autistic Me. For this episode, we're being joined by Gary Martinez, an independent fitness trainer and father of Monica, a 15-year-old autistic young woman. Gary integrates sensory activities into Monica's daily routine, balancing her mind and body to help her succeed. His experiences with exercise and overall fitness have led Gary to help others prevent or reduce autistic meltdowns with natural strategies. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thank you so much for having me. So before we begin with the uh, meltdown strategies, can you tell us a little bit about your background in fitness? Sure. I um, I've always been passionate about fitness and then I decided to go to school for it. And that was uh, actually in 2011. And I Completed that in 2012. And then in 2014, I decided to become an independent trainer because my daughter was diagnosed with autism, Monica, and I wanted to be there for her to provide more support and to provide more of a a role in her life to help her out. And when you say you're a a trainer, an independent fitness trainer, what does that mean for someone like myself? Could you explain? Are you a a coach? Do you help people develop routines? What do you normally do for a client? Sure. So independent means, you know, previously um, when I finished school, I was hired on at the YMCA. So I worked there for two years and we call those big box gyms because you're at a uh, one of those type of gyms. So I wanted to become independent to have more time for my daughter. So it's the same concept. You know, you, you train clients, you create a customized program that that fits their needs and then you you help them with their exercise program and and you work with them now you said that you were interested in fitness after your daughter's diagnosis i was interested in fitness um prior to that it's just i wanted to become a trainer down the road so i did that and then i learned that uh, one of the things that helps Monica on a daily basis is is integrating some of the the fitness exercises that come from my scope, but also some of the uh, the activities we learned in occupational therapy, which was one of our two first therapies that we had together to help Monica understand her brain and her body and how they work together. Because she started out really scared to walk. She was a toe walker. And she she didn't like to walk on the ground. There was a lot of things she couldn't do. She didn't have the coordination to tie her shoes. It was hard to take a bite of food. It was hard to chew. Things like that, brushing your teeth. And, you know, we had low muscle tones. So we had to learn different activities from that world and the fitness world. And we kind of just made them our own type of style. And that's something that that's helped her on a daily basis because she has sensory process in this order. And that's something that you don't grow out of, but you grow into. When was she diagnosed with autism? Was that early or was that something that happened at age two or three? It was later because girls a lot of times get diagnosed later because sometimes there's a label put on them that, you know, they're just being a girl. They're just being they're just being quiet for now. But don't worry, they'll turn the corner. We didn't turn the corner. So I want to say that we roughly got diagnosed around six. So it was it was later. So she had she had a lot of struggles. When I look at my daughters, Anne and Lee, so Lee is nine, Anne is seven. Anne is a toe walker and struggles with some basic motor skills. Lee, it's much worse. Even though she's nine, she has difficulty with utensils. She scissor walks, which is where one leg crosses in front of the other. So she's constantly tripping. We have an hour of physical activity every day. We're not seeing progress, even though we were under the guidance of occupational and physical therapy. So what would you tell a parent like myself about that connection between mind and body where there are days where I'm just like, maybe this isn't working. Maybe there's no hope. What, what do you tell someone like me is thinking of my daughters and so concerned that they're not getting that proprioception, they're not getting that sense of balance, that spatial awareness. What do you tell me? What I learned was, first of all, in the beginning when we were diagnosed, I knew absolutely nothing. I didn't know what the word autism was, sensory processing disorder. 
I was a parent in panic mode watching my daughter have meltdowns. So I was, I had to start from ground zero. And then as we went to this occupational therapy, and then I learned that, you know, you had a choice. You can drop your kid off and come back. You can sit in the lobby or you can actually go inside and observe the session. So I went to go inside and observe the session because I wanted to know how to help my daughter. I wanted to be an athlete for her life. So what I did was I took a notebook, I took a pen, and I wrote notes. I watched everything they did. I watched what wasn't working. I watched what was working. And then what I did was I implemented that stuff. So I brought it home, and I wanted to carry on those activities that were actually working for her. And then it's it was kind of like, okay, where do I see problems going at? Like, are we what's some other things that that could help us? And if I didn't know the answer, I would ask the therapist, like. You know, where else can I go look? Who do you mentor? What do you suggest? And that made me stay up into the wee hours in the morning learning what to do for my daughter. So it was a process. It took time. It wasn't easy. But, you know, we've overcome a lot of obstacles where, you know, now we're no longer a toe walker. One thing that one thing that was helpful for that was walking on soft, soft pillows in a circle. That was one thing that helped with that. And, you know, we were toe walking because we needed to feel we needed to feel our feet because our feet, like our hands, are the furthest extension from our body. So if we can't feel those parts of our body, that's scary. So that's one reason why I know my daughter was a toe walker. And then one thing we did along with uh, exercises was we wore like cowboy boots. And at one time we we wore some uh, some ankle weights to help eventually in time fluidly be able to to walk how we should you mentioned ankle weights and cowboy boots i purchased some adjustable weights for the girls i think they are little one pound weights that you can put in so you can go from one pound to seven pounds they strap i guess around the the ankles or on the the wrist for for workouts and they did have cowboy boots and that's an interesting concept that the is it the shape of the boot that forces them to use the entire foot or is there something about the foot what what helps the movement everybody's different as we know everybody's just different and for us it was it was the compression monica liked to feel that the boot was letting her feel her foot and her lower body so she can feel her her lower leg and her foot that made her a lot more relaxed a lot more calm and just a lot more confident that, you know what, I could feel my lower leg and I can feel my foot. And some t- and other things that I would do right there in that area, let's pretend I have my two hands right now and the ankle is in the middle. What I would do is I would stretch the foot and right above the ankle, I would stretch about 10 times. And I learned this from the therapist. And then I would go up to the knee and put my hand below the knee and the other hand above the knee. And I would stretch. So with that type of traction, that also gives that that heavy input that the lower body is craving so they can feel that, hey, you know what? My body's right there. I feel pretty good about it. And how did the pillows contribute to feeling, I don't know, safe? Or was it was it a sensory input from the pillows that helped with the toe walking? You're absolutely right. It was the safety that this was this was a soft, a soft needed item. On the ground because as we know the ground's uneven there's potholes there's you know there's slopes there's there's hills there's you know it's different there's cracks and it's hard surfaces are hard so it was the soft pillows that started to give her that confidence and that momentum with the other exercises combined that hey you know what i, I can feel it. it just feels okay it feels okay to walk as you were watching the physical therapy and occupational therapy and taking notes, which is a great strategy. I, I really, you know, I, I did the same and I am still trying to follow all the advice, but I don't come from a fitness background. So how did you decide what exercises and what activities worked well? A lot of times I was just writing notes. Here's what they're doing. And that's what we did at home because I couldn't, I can't tell. I'm not informed enough to know what benefits my girls. I certainly see that they're not developing the muscle tone I would have expected. They're not developing, you know, some of the things I want to help them develop. So how did you recognize what was and wasn't working? I would honestly track it. Like the date we started something, I would date it. 
and I would write down what we're doing and see if it's working and, and follow up on myself in like a week, two weeks, and at the end of the month. Is this working? Is it helping us? Yes or no? And if it's not, well, what else can I do? Is it the is it the lower leg? Is it the upper legs that, that I see that we're having a problem with? And how do we solve that? So I had to do like a little research. You know, what, what type of other activities do I have to ask the therapist? Do I have to research on my own or, and, and things like that or, or check with some other type of experts? Because I don't know everything. So I learned how to become a student and from becoming a student, being active, uh, doing those activities with her, then you become a practitioner. You mentioned the sensory processing is not just part of the autism, but it is also a separate diagnosis for Monica. Right. How does that affect her functioning life and how do you help her with that sensory processing through physical activity and, and exercise? I'm smiling right now <laughs> because I'm so happy you asked this question. So here's what I learned and that I will never forget this advice. A occupational therapist told me one time, imagine that you are swinging super fast on a merry-go-round. When that ride is over and you get up, you are trying to collect yourself. You're trying to make sense of you. And you're trying to make sense of the world. And that's what a kid with sensory processing disorder deals with on a daily basis. So you got to find what is the dot that's going to help. So when we were in that OT therapy, we started to learn what are the dots that help us make sense of our body and make more sense in the world. And one of our dots was swinging. So, you know, those years ago to right now, swinging today is one of our favorite activities and exercises. And it's one of our dots that helps Monica get through the day because she is getting that body awareness that she needs. Not only does she swing on the swings, but she looks up at the swing when she gets off the swing and she pushes the swing with her hands. So there goes the hands part, the, the bar extension of the body. So her hands, her arms, her shoulders, her, her core, which is, you know, the stomach area, the front side of the body, when she's pushing that swing, she's getting another form of exercise. And to take it to another level, she looks up at the swing and she's looking at the moving parts. So for Monica, looking at moving parts from a very young age until right now, that is that helps her focus. Something that she likes that moves, it helps her focus. It helps her stay alert. And it helps her relax. And for her, it's her own type of self-regulation. Uh, and that one activity is just like that does a lot of things to satisfy her needs. And when you say a swing, you're talking like a, a playground swing, right? With the yes, the chain or the rope down to a, a seat. And so she's swinging with the, the leg motion. That's right. Yep. You're absolutely right. And does she self-propel? Yep. At first, I had to push her. In those early years, I had to push her. She wanted to swing, but I had to push her. But as she got older and she got stronger and she got more in tune with her body, then she knew how to push herself. And one thing we added to that was, you know, we would go to school because school was a struggle for us in the early years. It's still not easy now. And what we used to do is we would get to school 20 minutes early to do these type of activities to prepare her for school because it's just like a warm up. Before you uh, do a workout at the gym, at home, or wherever that is, you know that if you do a warm up, you're going to get that body temperature that you need. You're going to reduce injury. You're going to increase your flexibility, and you're going to perform better in your workout. So for us, the warm up before school helped her with all those transitions, all those sounds, all those all those odors, all the different transitions in school. So it really helped her out. I really admire that you, you decided to become an independent fitness trainer to be available to support uh, Monica. And I've been fortunate as a college instructor to have my days to work with the, the girls. And one of the things you did to help Monica was you became a school volunteer and a school resource. Could you explain how being there with her helped her succeed in the school setting? At our second elementary, they were very, very open to doing whatever it takes to help Monica. 
and I really appreciate them because they wanted me to come to school at will to help her out because they didn't know all the answers. And they would call me and say, Mr. Martinez, Monica's having a rough time. You know, she's having a meltdown. She's crying. She's screaming. Um, can you come and do something? And I said, sure, I'll be there in 15 minutes. So I would go to the school, put on my sticker badge or put on my little necklace badge, walk into the room, take her outside to the playground. Or if the weather was bad, it did not matter. We know how to adapt. So we would do some of those exercises. If we were outside, we would swing. What I would do is Monica also loves dolls. She loves princesses from Disney movies. So I would take some of these dolls that she would like. And as she's swinging, I would role play and reenact scenes from these movies that she really likes, especially certain parts. And that would not only that activity was helping her out, but these these dolls are actually real in our world. So when I brought them to life, we had conversations and it just gave her more support that she needed. That was one thing that we did. But when we were inside and the weather was no good, other things that we liked to do was we used the hallway. So I would give her a piggyback ride, which is one of the things that she would like to do. And I will walk around in circles until she until she had enough. And I'll give her a piggyback ride. With the piggyback ride, there's different things you can do. Not only just walk with your kid on your back, but you can tilt them forward because when you tilt them forward, you're getting blood flow to the brain. And that's, of course, really good information for your brain to help them to be more alert and stuff. You can tilt yourself, of course, slowly and carefully. You can tilt right and you can tilt left. And if your kid likes going in circles, then we go in one direction in a circle And that just gave her just the support that she needed. So when she went back into class, she would have maybe an hour, two hours, or it could help her out for the whole rest of her day to have a better spirit and to do better at at school. It surprises me how often neurodiverse children, ADHD or autistic children are told, oh, well, you're misbehaving. So you lose your PE. You're acting up so you're not going to get to go to the library where it's quiet. So in effect, what they do is they they penalize the student by withholding the one thing that would actually help them self-regulate. Very true. I've mentioned, and, and Lee did on the podcast, that she was at the wiggle table because she wiggles too much. She rocks back and forth when she's anxious. So by taking away the PE or taking away the recess, what the teacher inadvertently did was increase her anxiety and get rid of her sensory calming. Right. Yeah. So what you were doing, your school actually allowed you to take Monica and give her that physical input, that sensory uh, stimulation and calming that she actually needed to be a better student. Right. Because in the beginning years, we couldn't even complete a half day of school. We would have to leave because it was too much for her. She, you know, we were nonverbal when we were diagnosed. So when we started preschool, that was that was a struggle. To give you a really quick story, as you're talking about PE, PE actually saved the day for us. One time I went to go volunteer for Monica at this other elementary school that we had to go to. And the teacher let me go in there. And when I walk into the classroom, Monica has her head in her arms. And she's basically taking a nap on a table while everyone else is doing the work. So I go there. I check in on Monica. She has no energy. Uh, I ask the teacher, can I take her out in the hallway? She says, yes. I take her out in the hallway. We do some of those activities that I just talked about. And then the bell rings. Next class is art. We go to our art class. That's one of her favorite things to do. She's very creative. She's an amazing artist. You should see some of her projects. She makes her own. Anyhow, in, in our class, it, the environment, it just was not good that day. Uh, she wasn't able to be active and do something. So our next class saved the day. That was PE. We went into PE class. The energy right off the bat, the vibe right off the bat, because Monica is all about vibes. If you have a good tone with her, a good vibe for her, that's going to give her the support that she needs. So we were in PE class. The teacher right away, I can see how positive he is. Monica goes into the class and she she's basically awoke awake because of the vibe and the atmosphere. So he's teaching them some type of fun game of tag. And Monica may not know all the rules, but she's running in the gym with the other kids. 
they're playing with her. She does what she can do. And he steps out of the gym and he comes up to me and says, Mr. Martinez, you know what? I love your daughter. She has the most amazing smile. And she's so positive when she comes into my class. And by the end of that class, Monica was a different kid. So PE, the activity for her brain and her body, that is what saved the day. And I, I personally thank that teacher at the end of the day. I said, you know what? Your class, your attitude, your energy just turned my daughter's day around. Did you find that teachers understood her needs or did you have to become the educator to help the faculty understand Monica? A lot of times I had to become the educator to the schools that were open to receiving that information. Some were open arms and some just kind of, it kind of falls on deaf ears. So I have to take advantage of the ones that are open arms. The second elementary we were at, the principal was open arms. He, he encouraged me to do everything I can do under my, my power to help Monica. And the teachers, they let me come in and, and do these, these breaks for her. So um, when you have that, that's a win-win. Sometimes not everyone's open. Sometimes they may not respect you as a parent trying to talk to them to educate them. So sometimes in that case, I did get through. It took a little work. Sometimes I had to bring in some expert resources. So it, it made them feel like I was on the same page. And it's just sometimes, you know, you got to do a, le- a little extra work. You can't give up. You got to dust it off and advocate and fight for your for your child so they can have the, the best situation um, while they're at school. For those of us who aren't familiar with sensory processing disorders, what were some of the triggers that Monica would experience in the school setting that caused sensory overload or sensory confusion? One of them is like being in line close to other kids was really overwhelming for her. I had to learn these things. I didn't know everything right away, of course. Like I said, I didn't know nothing. It took time to learn stuff. What I learned and then I t- passed on to the teachers was, can Monica be either in the front of the line or in the back of the line so she's not next to all these kids because it would help her feel a lot more comfortable in that setting. Same thing in the classroom. If she was sitting too close in the classroom, then she's around too much noise. She's around too much smells and she's just too close for anything. So I had to uh, let the teachers know about that. And if we can move towards more towards the back of the class. You are preparing an online training program for caregivers, parents, autistic support personnel. What do you want to teach those of us who have an autistic child in our lives? parents, caregiver, teacher, whoever they are, you know, I started out in panic mode and this program is designed to help people just know the basics and the foundation. So what, what I teach in the program is, is a lot of the components that a lot of kids with autism have and activities that can help them out from head to toe, role play or special interests that our kids have, like something that the child is really into, that is their anchor of support, is to teach these people how important it is to that and to, to give them support to go with that. Uh, one of the biggest pieces is nutrition, about how important nutrition is what we put inside our body, recommended foods for our kids, foods you might want to stay away from that, that can cause hyperactivity, behavior issues, um, and things like that. We, we wanna, I want to arm and weapon, weaponize people with tools that can help our kids uh, with, their, with their everyday living so they can have more of a fluid day. You mentioned nutrition. Was Monica or is Monica a picky eater? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so in the very beginning, um, she only basically ate like one or two foods. Mm. And, you know, a lot of our kids, they have a thing with textures and taste and all that sort of thing. So it was it was a process to overcome that. And it's something that I didn't want to force. So um, one of the things that helped us overcome that was a, a special interest. So I had to go back to the movie Alice in Wonderland. Here's a really quick example. So Alice has blonde hair and Monica loves these princesses and the movies that have blonde hair. So at that time, she's big time into her. And she's also into her right now because sometimes we go back into our past and we bring it back because she she still has a, a love for it. So I, I learned that a, a, parent, a parent has to be creative and learn what their kid's like and use that to help them out. So with nutrition, I decided to grab a banana and I was like, oh my God, Monica, 
and and I get like real, like I, I, I put on my pretend makeup and I, I turn into an actor. So I'm like, oh my God, Monica, I got this banana right here. And you know, I want Alice to keep her beautiful blonde hair forever. So I'm like, you know what I'm going to do with this banana? She's like, what dad, what, what? Because I have her attention. I'm talking about Alice, one of her favorite characters. I'm going to eat this banana so she can keep her blonde hair. So, you know, not too long after that, Monica was like, I want to eat banana too. I, you know, I, I want Alice to keep her blonde hair. I want Elsa to keep her blonde hair. And, and she went down the, the list of other blonde hair Disney characters. So that was one creative thing that worked for us where she started to be open to eating some different foods. Tonight we struggled with uh, Lee eating noodles. She just, I, I'm not sure if it's the texture or what, but it, they're just rice noodles. But she looked at those and like, yeah, that's not happening. Mm-hmm. And sometimes as a parent, especially, you know, as my wife said, you know, Susan's like, I made dinner. Everyone's eating dinner. And I'm like, well, you know, she may just really not like something about the noodles and she's not able to tell us what it is, but she doesn't want the noodles. <laughs> yeah. And, and that becomes something that all of us deal with when the child has sensory issues and, and you add it to the neurodiversity it's a real struggle because you care about nutrition. I don't want them to be unhealthy with their diets. I want them to have an outstanding diet with all the fruit and veg and, you know, all the, all the things they need, all the nutritional value they can get. And at the same time, you, you're dealing with a picky eater. So it's kind of this, what battles can I choose? But so far we've been able to, to avoid things like fried foods. We're, we're pretty good about that. But you know, when you're interested in whole body care, you certainly want the child to learn the value of eating healthy, but that sensory processing can certainly get in, get in the way and complicate it. Yeah. And one thing, you know, is like, like you said, choosing your battles. So one thing, you know, Monica does like, she loves her, her chicken nuggets or chicken tenders. It's been a big thing that she likes. But like you said, I've been able to work with her where now she eats fruits. She eats vegetables. And one activity I do with her to connect with food is, you know, we'll go to the uh, the grocery store and I have her do her own fruit picking. So with bananas, you know, for example, I'll say, Monica, um, I want you to find a bunch of bananas, one bunch of bananas that you really like. And make sure you get the ones that are like yellow and that they may have a few brown spots because we want those because they're most ripe. So she'll look for that. And then sometimes I have her look for apples, like look for the most red apples, the size that you want and pick out or just give her a number like four or five. So, so she can start to get a connection with the, that fruit that she does like. So she, you know, gets gets that connection with it and, then, you know, she'll she'll eat that. How do you work with other aspects of health with with Monica? You, she, you said she likes P.E. So how have you developed things like the poor body strength or the muscle tone that I'm struggling with, with my daughters. And I know other parents of autistic youth are struggling with, for some reason, it's very difficult to help them develop muscle tone. Yeah. You know, you, you have to um, be really creative and understand that sometimes it's not always just an exercise. Like that may be a, a big step for them. Sometimes it may just be a stretch that they have to do something that's a little more modified or maybe it's something where they don't even know they're doing an exercise but if they're but if they're sitting on a chair for example you can say hey can you you know uh spell your name while you're s- sitting up standing up and then sitting back down right there you just did a squat you know and earlier like like i mentioned monica was a toe walker and her her legs and her hips were not the strongest at that time. So one of our first steps was I would have her, and what she liked to do was she would step on my shoes (laughs) and we would hold hands and we would walk backwards, forward and sideways. And that was like a modified version of an introduction to just doing an activity. And then we transitioned gradually to um, doing what we call, we just made them our own, our own name and we called it together squats. So we just, we held hands and we just, you know, I just keep the steps really simple because it's all about simple. We held hands, 
we just got wide with our legs and we just sat down and sat up. You know, traditionally, when you're working with somebody with exercise, you're, you're counting numbers. OK, we're going to do this number. We're going to do this many sets. But for us, it's different. We might be spelling. We might be doing squats. And instead of numbers, we're spelling the name Alice. So you, you got to make it fun. You got to be a little creative and, and just find some different ways and uh, start with that very, very first step. I would love a physical fitness guide for parents of autistic children. It's, I, I love the idea of spelling their Disney princesses. That's something I'm dealing with too, is the Disney a special interest. It's something that connects to them. They really do like their, their Disney characters. And so that is something I, you know, right now we're just counting. Uh, sometimes we count by twos or count by threes or count by fives, but I love the idea of doing Alice or one of the other uh, Disney princesses or a character that they like who may not be a princess, but one of the characters they like. Yeah, I don't mean to, to jump in, but I, I want to tell you something right now about that. I don't know if your daughter is with this or not, but we, but Monica is, is that she's really into the villains also those evil characters. And she's fascinated that those evil characters, like they're so mean, she doesn't want them to harm the princesses, but she doesn't forget what they say in the movies. So like one example, this is, this is crazy, but, it, but I made it work was let's say there's a beauty and the beast movie where Belle is the princess. Gaston is the evil character who wants to marry Belle, but he also wants to marry her. She doesn't want to marry him. And he also wants, he doesn't want her to read no more. So he wants to shut down the library, take all our books away. So what I did with Monica is, you know, our kids are on computers, we're on devices and our posture, it hunches over. Oh, yeah. So in order to make her stretch her chest for better posture, I would say, Monica, Gaston is trying to take the books out of Belle's hand. I would say, get away, move your arms back like this. So what she would do is she would stand up and I was sure what to do. Make your arms straight at the side and pull them back so he can't get you. So I'm Gaston. So I'm trying to get Monica. She's Belle. She's pulling her arms back so he can't reach the books. What she's doing right there is she's squeezing her shoulder blades and her chest is getting a stretch. So I just had to learn how to get creative. I like that. And I hope that as you're working towards some resources, I know you have written an ebook uh, about life with Monica and you are planning th these training uh, courses online. I would love to encourage a, a fitness book since you're a, you're a fitness trainer. That's, these are little ideas that would help me so much. And I'm just now thinking about them. Oh yeah, I can use the Disney princesses. I can use some of these connections to like pillows and cowboy boots because I love to be cowgirls. <laughs> so there's, awesome. there are these things I can do that wouldn't lead to a conflict with them because they would love to do them. Right. Instead of fighting them to do the physical activity or to walk properly, why not make it something they want to do? Yeah. And I'll give you another bonus. Uh, we love watching also videos of these princesses on YouTube these these songs that are you know from the movies so what we would do is before we go to school in the house right now um is we use a hippity hop ball which is basically you know if you're at walmart or one of the stores in the sporting section those big exercise balls that you sit on well the hippity hop ball or hopper ball you know they have a different name is the one with the handle on it so what we do is monica will watch her favorite videos while well, she's hopping on the ball because she likes to, one of her activities she likes to do is to hop and bounce, like just like jumping. So right there, she's getting two benefits. She's watching a special interest that's lighting up her brain, making her focus and alert. And she's getting that, that activity of exercise that's also helping her brain and body uh, just get organized and ready for the day. But sometimes we need that throughout the day, so more than once. It's just as needed where, where she sees fit. So she is 15 and going into eighth grade. I don't know what size she is. I saw some pictures of her. My girls are a little large for their age. And that also then makes some of these physical things a little more awkward for them. It's like they haven't mentally grown into the bodies they have. I don't know how else to describe it. You know, the, the seven-year-old is 80 pounds and 
52 inches. She, she's a, a little giant next to some of her classmates. And so they don't want to play with her. They're afraid of her because she's energetic and, you know, at recess or at PE, she, she does love to move. How do you recommend harnessing that energy that is so important in a way that lets them play with other kids without scaring the other kids? What I was going to say, first of all, when you started talking was maybe they can't do all these exercises I'm talking about right now. Maybe one thing for them that they do with you and your wife um, on the off time before school is maybe uh, it's something where you take a walk around the park or a walk around the playground. And that's walking is just a very good thing to do on a daily basis um, just to condition yourself. And it's also very good for your mind because anytime you do any type of activity, your mind feels really good and any type of like negative emotions, they don't like that. So they, they, they run away when we're doing something good like that for the body. So maybe it could be walking and it could be talking about a special interest that they like. That could be the first step. And maybe you have to on the weekend on your time, do a role play scene at the playground and pretend you're the students and kind of uh, just go over some situations and kind of try that out and see what happens. Right now we do our exercise after lunch, an hour or two after lunch, and we do our walks in the evenings. But I think reversing that some days and doing it in the morning to get them active so they're able to to then function instead of, okay, you ate breakfast, now let's do our homework. That's a difficult way to start the, the morning even for me. You know, let's go straight to work right after eating. Mm-hmm. That's tough, but I like the idea of walking around and, and getting the blood flowing. And you know, for me, before Monica even wakes up, every single morning I, I've had to um, take on this role to to be her, to be an athlete for her life. Is I I make sure I wake up early, you know, an hour or two before Monica wakes up, and I have to take care of myself first in order to to give my best to her. So I have to do my own type of self care routine, and you know, a lot of times that consists of doing just a lot of stretching. So I'm you know, so I can move good throughout the day. Um, I eat before she wakes up. I may eat just like a small portion because then I want to eat with her when she wakes up so we can have conversation, be together with each other. So I, I like to get up early and do a self-care routine. So I'm so I'm ready and prepared for that. But I want to I want to include something as a bonus. Like sometimes Monica doesn't want to do activities. Every day is different. But at one time I was a massage therapist. So sometimes she may not have that energy. So in the morning, if if that's how it is when she wakes up, I may just have to do a little massage on her body. And it's basically giving her body's, you know, the input that it's craving. And you don't have to be a therapist by no means. But, you know, if you can do something like that, whether it's uh, rolling one of those big balls softly over them and seeing what kind of pressure they like. Or if you're just doing like two hands and you're putting... Uh, one hand on the bottom of the arm and one on the top and you're asking your kid, hey, you know, is it OK if I do some soft squeezes or do you, you know, what kind of pressure do you want? That's giving the body right there some some input that it needs. Uh, you do have a son? Yep. Christian's 11 years old. OK, so you have an 11 and a 15 and you said that she uh, that Monica actually does interact with and play with her brother. Do they engage in physical activity together, like running, playing, tossing a ball? Do they do those physical things together? They do uh, different things like that. Um, the main thing is like Monica's really sensitive to tone. So it's it's all about the person that's with her, how they talk to her. She like, she's, she's a low tone person. So my son has a low tone voice and she's very comfortable with it. So that that opens the door for when he learned how to play with his sister, that they they watch videos together and they crack up laughing. Um, He created a role play character for her. She took to him because he has a positive spirit and energy about him. So at one time he was into King Kong (laughs) to Kong and she wanted what he liked. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he made a pretend character called Kong. And we call him Brother Kong. So he, he's our pretend character. He's invisible. But we speak with a, with a certain voice that we do. It's pretty funny. And Kong is like a kind of like a smart aleck. Like everything that we say we do, he'll, he'll be like a little smart mouth and he'll say the opposite. And for Monica, it makes her laugh. So he brought a character into her life that really makes her laugh. And because 
he's so positive and has a low tone voice. Um, he gets further with her than, than a lot of other people do. And they, they swing together. Um, they've made projects together and it's just, it's been a, it's been a good experience to watch them play together. He's, he's actually her best pure play partner. Even though he's 11, he is in some ways like a big brother. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's very, very mature. He's a very loving and caring person and he's, he's beyond his age as far as that goes. That's awesome. I'm working very uh, diligently, I guess, through um, setting things up carefully to get the girls to play together and to learn how to share and learn how to acknowledge each other and play together as a as a pair politely. It's definitely a challenge. And it's not because the autistic is rejecting other people. A lot of times it's just it's overwhelming. It's just all like you said, at school, being too close to other kids, being in the same room too close. So sometimes it's just a matter of even letting them play a little bit further apart than what might seem okay to other people. But for them, they can play across the room and still talk to each other. And it's knowing things like that that I think helps the helps the autistic child, uh, the neurodiverse child, form those social connections. You're absolutely right. Because um, for our kids, I mean, we're, we're extraordinary. We have superpowers. And for Monica, like a lot of our kids, is that. It's not that they don't want to socialize and be included in conversations with people. It's just like you said, it, it can be overwhelming because our kids, they, they have a deeper level where they can, they can read you, they can feel you, and that's a lot within the process. So they go in reverse a lot of times and they isolate themselves because it's too overwhelming for them. But I've had to teach a lot of kids uh, when they've asked about Monica, you know, why does she, why does she only focus on this and that? And I've, I've actually been able to stop some bullying from happening at school. And one quick story is um, one day at the playground, we, we finished our activity and I heard kids making fun of her voice because like I said, we were nonverbal. So with all those meltdowns, screaming and crying, our voice doesn't sound like our age. So I heard this and I said, that's an opportunity. So I ran over there to those kids and I was like, hey, um, uh, I had to find an icebreaker. I was like, um, well, oh, that, I like your shirt. Uh, you know, I wasn't sure if it was a basketball or hockey team. So I was like, that's your team, right? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, have you ever been to one of their games before? And they're like, yes, I have. And I was like, so when your team scores, makes a goal, shoot a basket, like I said, I forgot the sport. Um, how does that make you feel? And they're like, oh, man, I celebrate, I scream, I yell. And I was like, so what happens like the next day sometimes? How does your voice sound? Oh, it does. You know, it's a sore throat, or sometimes I lose my voice because I'm cheering for my team. I was like, "Yeah, right." I was like, "That girl right there that you're saying, uh, you know, something about her voice. You didn't like how it sounded. That's actually my daughter." So um, they got quiet, but they saw that I had a calm, low tone. So there goes that low tone. But we made a connection with the sports team, and I said, "You know, my daughter talks like that because." She, for a long time, didn't know how to talk. But maybe one day her voice might sound more normal for you and me. So that's what happened to her. So then, it, so then they said, well, why does she swing a lot? And I told them. So we, we actually made a friendship. And those kids actually became our friends. And they actually advocated our school because they said, what can we do to help Monica? And I told them, when you see her having a bad day, you talk to her about these Disney characters. Or you tell her, make sure you swing. So they would come to school instead of walking to school in a bad mood sometimes, like, you know, because our kids just don't get the, the activity they need. They would come and they would swing with us. So I, I went from pushing Monica on a swing in the morning to pushing about five or six kids. I don't remember how it was. And we made friends. I really appreciate that kind of input as a parent, because those are things that we all have to deal with as, as our kids grow up. How are they going to make friends? How are they going to be active? How are they going to participate? And it's already a, a difficult system to navigate with the adults, much less than helping them with their own peers. Absolutely. It can be exhausting just trying to help their teachers uh, deal with them, much less their classmates. Yeah, it's very mentally draining. If Someone listening to this podcast, if they wanted to learn more about fitness training and about uh, meeting the needs of, of meltdowns, how would they learn what you're, you're preparing for parents and for caregivers? How would they find your information? 
I'm on social media. You can go to, or just give you two so it's not overwhelming for people. You can go to Facebook or Instagram and just type Gary Martinez Jr. You can send me a message and you know we can take it from there. Now let's talk a little bit as we wind down here about the meltdowns and your strategies. That's what people think of. Unfortunately, when they think of my daughter and the, the little one, they remember her meltdowns. Anne was explosive. Mm-hmm. It's gotten better now that she's a little more verbal. But when she was completely nonverbal, she was like a, a, a stick of dynamite. She was she somewhat literally blew my wife's eardrum. Susan has um, now constant ringing in the ears. And the doctor said it was probably from uh, being trapped in a car with the screaming kid. Mm-hmm. I believe it. And it's just shocking to think that our, our little one did that. Let's shift to, to the thing that uh, caught my attention, and that was meltdowns and how you have approached meltdowns. Typically, they say, don't get involved in a meltdown. Wait till it's over. Provide a retreat. Provide space. Um, don't get involved because you'll make it worse. You know, when our kid has a meltdown, it's not their fault, first of all. Something overwhelmed them. Something triggered them in the environment. So they have a chemical imbalance that they, can, they cannot control, and it can last that day. It can carry on for a week or a month because of how bad it, it makes them suffer. So one time at the park, a quick story is uh, I'm walking around the playground where Monica's at. There's a lot of people that day. The weather's good, but it changes because there's wind. There's, you know, Colorado has different types of weather. The weather changes here in 10 minutes. One minute, I, I heard someone screaming and I was like, that's Monica. She's on top of the playground screaming and she's hitting herself, causing self-harm. So I like, okay, I'm running up there. So I run up there and she's loud and she's screaming. And there's a crowd and I'll let you know I'm an introvert, but I broke out of my shell for my daughter. So we have all these eyeballs watching us. She's screaming. She's attacking herself and she's saying like, uh, I hate myself. I'm going to kill you, dad. I'm going to chop her head off. And she's saying things like that. She doesn't mean to, right? Because she's having this meltdown. She can't control it. So I immediately go to, I use two tools to help her out. I know I can distract her if I go into one of these Disney movies. So I go into the movie Frozen, if I remember right. So I start, I talk about a really important scene. And I learned one time from a body language coach how to match the tone and how to help them get down. So I jumped into the scene where I said, Monica, oh my God, I can't believe that Hans you know, he, he put Elsa in a dungeon. She didn't do anything wrong. She didn't deserve to get handcuffed. She just didn't know how to control her powers. So she, you know, when she was able to escape, she ran away into the mountain. And then her sister, Anna, went to go rescue her because she knew she didn't want to be alone. And that she loved her. And it was all just an accident. So that gradually helped Monica uh, transition her tone, stop to hit herself and to listen to me. So I grabbed her attention with that movie. And then we go into tool number two. That first one right there was role play. The second one is uh, a sensory activity where I saw a soccer net across the field in the grass. And I said, okay, I told myself next movie was the little mermaid. So I was like, Oh my God, Monica. Um, she's like, what dad? I had her attention. I knew I was getting her out of this meltdown. So I said, that's Ursula, the evil octopus from the Little Mermaid, that soccer net right there. And I can see what she's doing right now to, to Ariel, the princess. She's like, what, Dad, the mermaid? I was like, she is grabbing her. She's trying to take her voice box so she can sign that paper so she can marry the prince and not Ariel. So Monica was really concerned about that. And I was like, do you want to go help Ariel? She's like, yeah, Dad, I want to go help Ariel. So we ran down the playground. And Monica's not even a runner at that time. We run down the playground, we run to that soccer net, and the soccer net is actually the tentacles is what I called it. Monica's brother and sister at that time were rounding the corner on our bikes, and I was like, come here, guys. Monica's having a meltdown. This is Ursula. The net is her tentacles. Let's give her some heavy work activity for her body, and let's tell her to rescue you. The net is, uh, is, is grabbing you, and you're falling on the ground. Let her rescue us. So one by one. Monica was rescuing us. So we fell on the ground on purpose. Help, Monica, help. And Monica's rescuing us. She's, she's really into the scene. She's pulling us. So when she's pulling us, when she's bending down 
and she's grabbing us. She's getting that heavy work to help her body out. So her brain and body are starting to get that input they need to, to get back to herself and get out of the meltdown. So then I start to laugh and we're laughing like, oh, Monica, we fell down again. So we keep falling down. Monica's laughing and she's pulling us up and I fall right back down and she's pulling me up. And by that time, we got out of the meltdown. So after that, Monica grabbed my hand and she said, Dad, let's go. And I was like, where are we going, Monica? She said, Dad, I want to go swing. So we walk back to that playground where we had a meltdown. And she is back to herself. And she's swinging on the swing. And one of our favorite things to do while we're swinging is we're singing songs. So we were, we were singing songs. And then all of a sudden we heard, there was a little kid that fell. But he was okay. So the parents jumped in. It wasn't a hard fall. But Monica got really concerned because she's a loving and caring kid. She's like, Dad, what happened? I was like, Monica, it's okay. So there goes that low tone. It's okay. Kid had a little fall. It wasn't bad. Parents came to help him out. So Monica was like, oh, okay, Dad. And for the rest of the day, Monica was back to herself. And we, we got out of the meltdown. So I actually went against the grain. I entered the meltdown because I knew some things that would help her out. So you suggest entering the, the meltdown with role play and then guiding the child towards an activity, some physical movement. For us, because those are components that I know that help her out is uh, it was my my soul. My soul decision was telling me you need to go help her and, and it, it worked out. That's interesting to me is the idea that you're, you're pulling her out of the meltdown instead of just letting it basically exhaust her. Right, right. That's too often what we hear is we'll just let them go until they get over it or they're just too tired to continue. Yep, you're right. And so I like the idea of guiding, guiding the child out of the, the meltdown, especially since in, in your case and in ours, you're dealing with potentially self-injurious behaviors. The, I don't want to see my daughters hitting themselves, pulling at themselves, and in other ways, um, hurting themselves. And, and generally, they, they, as you said, they dislike themselves during those times. They, they engage in a lot of uh, self uh, negativity too, not just self injurious behavior physically, but, but emotionally. Yeah. And that's, that's just painful as a parent. You don't want to hear your child say, I hate myself. I, I watched that in the beginning when we were diagnosed and it, it broke my heart because I didn't, I, I was helpless, but it was even worse for her because she's the one going through it. So it was, it was good that I learned some tools from a lot of people and then just some things that are things that she likes and it was our steps to get out of it. And we, we, we had them before and there was, you know, there was other tools that I use and I'm just so glad to have them. I really appreciate you taking this time to discuss what life has been like with Monica as, as a father, I appreciate having that information and having the perspective of a fitness trainer who understands that there's a physical component uh, to neurodiversity. It's not just about the brain. It's about the mind and body. Mm-hmm. You're, yeah, you're spot on. I really do appreciate that. So again, I want to thank Gary Martinez for joining us on the Autistic Me podcast. Mr. Martinez, it has been a pleasure speaking to you on the Autistic Me. Likewise, and thank you so much for having me on.